Welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday in the academic year at this time in this place. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'm just going to quickly go over the um, talks for the next couple of weeks. So on uh, November 5th, uh, Susan Schnaff Schnaffnet is coming from UCSB, and her talk is entitled Child Marriage in Context, Understanding the Drivers of Early Marriage in Rural Tanzania. Then the next week is uh, Veterans Day, and we'll be back here on November 19th um, for a talk uh, by Jeremy Coster from University of Cincinnati entitled Cross-Cultural Variation in the Life History of Human Foraging Skills, followed by uh, uh, Tom Morgan on November 26th from ASU, uh, talk entitled Experimental Human Gene Culture Coalition. So look forward to that, and um, today I'm very pleased to introduce Daniel Benishek uh, from UNLV Department of Anthropology, who's going to be talking about human maternal uh, placenta baby. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thanks to Brooke for the invitation. I sincerely appreciate it. And thanks also to uh, the Center for Behavior, Evolution, and Culture. I think we're going to touch on all three of those things today uh, for the speaker series. I'm delighted to be here and to talk to you about some of my research on this very unusual uh, and media-friendly topic, from placenta phagy. So I'll begin with just a, an overview, because this is really going to be a, a wide-ranging talk. Uh, we'll start with a brief evolutionary history of the placenta, of course. So we'll talk, uh, we'll define what placenta phagy is, discuss some of the evolutionary hypotheses to explain uh, placenta phagy. Um, We'll then turn to the YAML research and observational experimental research that's been done looking at the effects and benefits of placenta phagy. Uh, then uh, turn to the emerging alternative medicine maternal health trend of maternal placenta phagy. I'm guessing many of you have heard of this. This is typically done with women taking placenta in an encapsulated form. And we'll talk a little bit about that and some of uh, our, our research in that area. Some of the public health implications associated with that. And then uh, finish out with some future research directions. So the story of the placenta, and thus placenta phagy, uh, begins some 250 million years ago uh, with the therapsids. Uh, these reptiles were the ancestors to all modern mammals. And uh, these are the monotremes, marsupials, uh, and placentals, or uh, eutherians. The monotremes, those unusual, uh, rare, egg-laying mammalian oddities, such as the platypus and the spiny anteater, uh, enjoy two of the three major breakthroughs in uh, therapsid evolution. Internal body temperature regulation, homeothermy, uh, along with body hair, uh, and lactation, uh, although they uh, feed their young without the use of nipples, something not uh, many know, but that's a talk for another time. The monotremes uh, split from the marsupials and eutherians about 166 million years ago. Uh, marsupials, uh, by the way, there's only a handful of monotremes uh, known to science, five species in total. Uh, uh, marsupials, on the other hand, um, uh, there's over 300 known species, most of them in, um, in Australia. Uh, they do have a placenta like eutherians, but it is simple, and offspring are born early and finishing developing outside the uterus in a pouch. The eutherians, over 4,000 species of placentals, split off from marsupials about 160 million years ago and have a great diversity of placental types and shapes and sizes. Um, and in fact, another way to, uh, to make sense of some diversity associated with different placental types uh, is uh, uh, to look at how deeply they uh, embed the uterine wall. So apes and rodents have a hemochorial placenta that, that root deeply into the maternal uterine blood supply. This is also one of the reasons that childbirth is so dangerous for women uh, uh, because of postpartum hemorrhage, uh, while other uh, mammals uh, have epithelial coral or endothelial coral placentas, and they uh, um, have differential rooting into the uterine wall. Epithelial coral, uh, the, sh the most shallow, and endothelial coral, something 
uh, intermediate. The placenta, uh, the word derives from the Latin pla uh, placus, uh, meaning flat plate or cake, and you can see the, uh, the human form of uh, placenta is discoid in shape. Uh, there's several others, as you can see. Um, and it, it that makes sense that uh, the first mention of uh, the placenta appears in, in, in written form, appears in uh, Rialdo Colombo's uh, anatomical work in 1559. Uh, part of that, you can look at some of the sketches of Da Vinci, for example, and you don't see a placenta. It was a pod-shaped uh, uh, encasing. But the human placenta was identified, and it is this discoid uh, shape, and therefore the name uh, a flat uh, disc or, or cake certainly makes sense. So despite all the variable placental shapes uh, and sizes and uh, levels of uterine invasiveness, all placentas serve the same basic function. They all bring food and oxygen from the mother. They all excrete waste products back to the mother for disposal. Uh, they all manufacture various products vital to sustain pregnancy, including hormones, a lot of them actually. And they all filter harmful substances in the mother's circulation. And that's a point that has an asterisk next to it and something we'll come back to a little bit later on in the talk. The diverse shapes, sizes, and structures of the placenta are another reason to marvel at this product of evolution. Why did nature make so many different kinds of placentas? No other organ in the body shows this degree of variation. For the most part, comparative biologists tell us kidneys look and function like kidneys, hearts like hearts, lungs like lungs, uh, across mammalian taxa, but not so for the enigmatic placenta. We're really not sure why uh, we have all these different uh, placental forms to this day. So I told you it was going to be a brief history of the placenta. Now moving on to placentophagy. Maternal placentophagy defined. This is the mother's ingestion of placental tissue, uh, as well as amniotic fluid and placental membranes during uh, labor and delivery uh, and after parturition. Maternal placentophagy is ubiquitous among mammals, uh, at least terrestrial mammals. And there's reasons we think that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, for marine mammals. We can talk about perhaps in the Q&A. But for terrestrial mammals, this is a ubiquitous behavior. Um, it has been uh, documented in rodents, lagomorphs, ungulates, carnivores, not even primates. Um, and I will say that given its ubiquity, and by the way, uh, again, uh, non-human primates including uh, all the great apes, uh, um, save ourselves, um, I will say that despite the fact that it's such a ubiquitous behavior, um, not all females in all species engage in placentophagy. This, is, this has been well documented. So in some species, uh, like cattle for example, and rodents, 80-90% uh, of mothers will, will, will eat the placenta and, amniotic, and, and consume the amniotic fluid. In some other species, like horses for example, maybe less than 10% of these animals do, although they have plenty of cases that have been documented. So there's a wide variation. Uh, there's various reasons for that. Um, parity seems to have something to do with it. Uh, Multiparous uh, females are much more likely to engage in placentophagy across species uh, than the one. But uh, uh, this is still somewhat of a mystery as well. And please, Feel free to uh, raise your hand or just shout out a question if you need some clarification as we go. Okay, so we have this ubiquitous mammalian uh, behavior. Um, why do we have it? Uh, lots of people have speculated about this. There hasn't been a whole lot of hypothesis testing regarding placentive aging, but there have been a lot of armchair, there's been a lot of armchair speculating about it. And the, the one that everyone comes up to me and says, well, Spanish Shark, you're wasting your time with this, you know, asking questions about maternal placentophagy, it's obviously a predator avoidance, right? Clean the nest site, uh, avoid predators. And uh, sure enough, this is uh, always at the top of the list of any list of uh, uh, 
hypotheses regarding placenta phagy, maternal placenta phagy, but there's others. General maternal hunger following birth, this idea that most uh, mammals uh, don't eat for extended periods of time before giving birth, sometimes uh, uh, more than 24, 48 hours. And so that once they do deliver, they're just ravenously hungry and the placenta is right there and shoot, why not uh, enjoy a meal? Uh, another is a temporary shift to carnivory. This has been proposed because lots of uh, uh, animals that uh, eat, st strictly eat uh, vegetable uh, uh, plant foods uh, are, are placentophagic as well. So there's this idea that something happens at parturition and a, a switch is flipped and the mother uh, has this temporary ravenous carnivory uh, that passes and then eventually she goes back to grazing or browsing. The final is acquisition of placental hormones that uh, enhance some kind of maternal care. And I have up here, uh, for example, increases prolactin levels that may influence lactation. Uh, and there's been, there have been others proposed as well. So these all seem reasonable, uh, to be sure. Uh, the question is, uh, do we have any uh, data that would refute them? First of all, there's, there's no reason why all of these things couldn't be uh, acting on selection and that we have multiple reasons for placentophagy across taxa. This certainly isn't the most parsimonious uh, explanation, and we'll talk uh, some more uh, in a bit about why that's an unlikely scenario. Uh, um, but in, in, in any respect, uh, this is certainly a possibility that we can't completely discount. Uh, most people that are serious, uh, seriously working in this area, though, are looking for the more parsimonious uh, explanation that is able to account for the, the greatest number uh, of instances of placenta phagy. So we know from some observational and experimental data that some of these hypotheses don't seem to work, at least in the general sense, for an explanation uh, for this mammalian behavior. In terms of predator avoidance, the favorite of most people who uh, just hear about placenta phagy, um, there's the example of apex predators. And we know that apex, apex predators like wolves and lions uh, are uh, very much uh, placenta phages. Uh, now, it isn't as though apex predators do not suffer from some predation, particularly of their young. Uh, this certainly is uh, the case in some, in some respects, but it, uh, it it is, the predation pressure is lower, certainly on apex predators, significantly so than other uh, animals. In addition, there is interesting data regarding non-nesting uh, animals. And I have here an example of followers at birth. Most ungulates can be divided into, uh, uh, particularly the ruminants, could be divided into two categories, followers and hiders. Uh, followers are animals uh, uh, like um, horses and sheep that uh, are standing uh, very soon after birth and then follow uh, the dam, follow the mother uh, to uh, a new area to graze or for safety after, uh, after birth. The placenta or the, the remains of the amniotic fluid and so forth are typically uh, still uh, there at the birth site. Hiders, on the other hand, are animals who um, once born uh, are, uh, are hidden by their mothers, they usually have some sort of camouflage or cover, and they stay there while the mother is away uh, foraging, browsing for extended periods of time uh, and, and until uh, she comes back to retrieve them. If you look across taxa uh, among ungulates and particularly ruminants, what you find is about the same percentage of placenta phages uh, for species who uh, typically engage in following behavior versus hiding behavior after birth. And this doesn't really support the idea that it's, uh, it's a predator avoidance. If it were predator avoidance, uh, you wouldn't typically see, you would think, you wouldn't see as much placenta phagy, maternal placenta phagy among followers. So they're, uh, they're mobile, they're up and moving, and uh, no need to eat the placenta to uh, to disguise um, the, the smells or to eliminate the smells uh, that might draw predators. There's other uh, species uh, that are, uh, such as arboreal primates, who also, this issue of mobility is, uh, is worth noting. Uh, 
many arboreal primate species give birth, of course, in the canopy, and uh, they are able uh, very quickly to move with their, uh, with their neonate. Um, and yet we find from observational studies that many of these mothers will spend hours in one spot where they have given birth uh, eating the placenta and actually uh, paying more attention to the placenta than they do actually their, their own young. Um, because they're mobile, uh, and even if they're nesting in trees um, to give birth, Letting the placenta drop to the ground, uh, which again there is predation uh, in the canopy, but you're, it's certainly uh, relatively safe compared to the ground. And uh, allowing the placenta to fall to the ground, uh, or allowing the, and then staying put, or allowing the placenta to fall to the ground, and then moving with neonate would make a lot more sense uh, if again predator avoidance was uh, what was driving this behavior. Uh, but that's not what we, uh, but that's not what we see. And in fact. There's been several studies that have shown, uh, that have, have observed mothers dropping placentas uh, f uh, after they're delivered uh, uh, from the canopy, and the mothers actually climbing down out of the canopy with their neonate to retrieve the placenta to eat it, and then going back up in the canopy. So again, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of predator or whatever behavior. And finally, there's the, uh, uh, or I, I'm sorry, I should say next, there's the issue of a shift to uh, general hunger. Uh, observational studies here also cast doubt on this hypothesis. Uh, uh, again, there are some animals, rats and giraffes, for example, that uh, typically uh, do not stop eating before birth. They can eat up to several hours before uh, parturition. Uh, so they uh, shouldn't be uh, as ravenously hungry as other animals that stop a couple of days ahead of time, 48 hours ahead of time. And of course with ungulates, ruminants again, oftentimes spring births, uh, after uh, offspring is born, there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of available food um, immediately in the vicinity, and uh, so this shift to carnivory is interesting. Oh, what's an ungulate? An ungulate, this, uh, ungulates are uh, uh, deer, uh, uh, goats, uh, sheep, uh, these are uh, elk, uh, all of the, these animals, uh, hooved animals fall into uh, that, that taxonomic category. And there's m many livestock do as well, so ruminants are a, sub, a subcategory of, of ungulates. <coughs> In terms of a temporary shift to carnivory, uh, this also doesn't jive with a lot of the observational data. Um, when uh, rat mothers are uh, allowed different types of meat, liver, beef, and pork, uh, after delivering, uh, they'll invariably consume the placenta rather than uh, the, the alternative uh, meats. So there's something special about this particular tissue that uh, is driving the behavior. So there has been some hypothesis testing work done, mostly by Mark Crystal. This is uh, most of this experimental work, rather than observational studies, most of this experimental work uh, has been done with rodents, uh, mostly rats, but some mice. And Mark Crystal at SUNY Buffalo uh, has been doing this work over uh, about a 35 or 40 year period uh, and has made some remarkable findings. Um, and it's pretty clear that uh, we do have evidence of demonstrable effects and even benefits. Uh, with respect to placentophagy, at least among uh, rodents and uh, some other uh, uh, mammals. Crystal's work uh, in the 1970s, when there was a lot of interest in endogenous opioid production, this was during a running craze, people were talking about the runner's high and all that, and Crystal and his team at City Buffalo got caught up in that uh, um, interest and uh, wondered if there might be some sort of analgesic uh, analgesic effect associated with uh, with um, uh, with birth, and 
uh, essentially through a series of, experiment, uh, of experiments over about a 10 year period, they were able to identify uh, a, a, an effect, an opioid analgesic enhancing effect. So uh, the, the compound, the molecule or molecules that they've identified uh, are not opi opioids themselves, but they facilitate or improve the action of endogenous opioids. And they called this factor a placental opioid enhancing factor, POEF. Now, POEF, as I said, is a molecule or molecules found in placenta and amniotic fluid, and when ingested, modifies some of the behavioral effects of central uh, uh, opioids. POEF, to work, has to be eaten. Um, you have to have an intact, intact gastric vagus nerve in order for the effect, uh, for this innervation uh, effect, this potentiating effect, um, enhancing effect to take place. And they've shown all of this experimentally uh, with rats and mice uh, using uh, pain avoidance uh, experimental designs. So we know from Crystal's work that at least in rodents, there is this uh, analgesic enhancing effect associated uh, with uh, the consumption of amniotic fluid uh, or placental tissue. And that is pretty, a pretty big deal in and of itself if we think about, uh, particularly for human moms, the pain associated uh, with childbirth, this, is, uh, this would seem to be a pretty big deal. Uh, maybe makes uh, some of our, uh, the topic that we'll be discussing in a little bit even more surprising. Uh, but uh, that's not all. Crystal and his team also, over the, the ensuing years, uh, also found that not only were, did POEF work to uh, decrease pain in these uh, mothers who are giving birth, and by, by the way, remember this is all with, with uh, most of this research is with uh, rats and mice, and so uh, rats give birth to 10, 12, 14 uh, pups at a time, uh, these mothers are actively licking the vaginal area while they're delivering their first pups. They're getting some of that amniotic fluid immediately. Uh, these effects last uh, after ingestion around 20, 25 minutes. So uh, this mom, uh, this rat mom, this, rouse, this, this mouse mother can have sort of a nice little op uh, opioid drip basically going while she's delivering these 14 pups. So this is, uh, this is no uh, small uh, issue. Crystal and his team also, however, went beyond this and looked at uh, neurochemical effects that uh, seem to not only uh, enhance attraction, and this would be not only for mothers, that this typically isn't a problem for, for mothers that have just given birth, but for, uh, for uh, other uh, females in the group, uh, even males, uh, there's usually extended avoidance behaviors uh, in rodents, and uh, the placenta uh, does seem to attract these non-maternal uh, outsiders, uh, both juveniles and uh, adults. And there can be some obvious uh, um, uh, fitness-enhancing implications of that if uh, these, these pups are getting attention sooner. But more, more to the point, rather than just attraction, the consumption of POEF also seems to increase uh, caretaking behavior. So caretaking behaviors of the moms, if the moms don't, if the placenta is withheld from them, uh, after they give birth, these rat and mice moms, uh, they are slower uh, to engage in caretaking behaviors, uh, grooming, licking, uh, as well as moving the pups uh, than if they consume the placenta or uh, consume some of the uh, amniotic fluid. So caretaking is certainly enhanced, and, it, and, and a lot of this is, uh, it initiates uh, uh, sooner. And we'll come, one might say, well, uh, that might just be due to the fact that they're not in pain. Uh, these moms are consuming uh, the, uh, the POEF in the fluid and in the tissue, and so because they're not in pain, that frees them up, essentially to engage in these maternal caretaking behaviors sooner. And that could be, but there's some other data to suggest that it's more than that. It's more than just pain reduction. It's also something else uh, that's leading to enhanced uh, caretaking behavior. We also know from a very few studies looking at uh, placenta consumption and what it does to hormonal profiles that uh, it does indeed uh, change hormonal profiles with 
uh, lactogenic hormones, um, those that promote uh, lactation like, uh, like prolactin and those that suppress it with progesterone. Uh, and it does so in the uh, expected uh, uh, directions. But as you can see, some of this data is, is, quite, uh, is quite old. In the 1980s when Blank and Friesen did their, their, um, uh, their classic work. Again, with rats in this case. Interestingly enough, some of these effects uh, extend to uh, non-maternal uh, placenta phages. So uh, there are some preliminary findings uh, reported just in the last several years uh, that suggest enhanced caretaking behavior effects uh, to female siblings. So these would be uh, uh, siblings, half or full siblings, from a different litter. So these are, are um, uh, mature uh, uh, siblings uh, uh, of the pups that are being born to the same mom. And what we've seen in, uh, in, these, uh, in these rodents are the females, typically the females uh, from a previous litter, will uh, be interested in mom giving birth to a new litter. Uh, they'll share in the placenta with her. And uh, for those uh, animals that engage in that behavior, they're more likely to engage in more caretaking behaviors of their sibling pups. Uh, and this has been manipulated uh, uh, experimentally so that we know uh, it's not just a matter of uh, the ones that are most interested in caretaking being the ones that are eating the placenta. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, in addition, there are some biparental species, uh, dwarf hamsters, um, uh, uh, California uh, mice, who are also biparental. And we see there in experimental work that placenta ingestion by those males uh, for, in the case of California mouse fathers, decreases anxiety associated uh, with those mice. And again, this is measured experimentally. Uh, and uh, in rats, even though they don't, they're not biparental, uh, it does produce analgesic enhancing uh, effects in rats. Um, so um, again, this is, this is done experimentally, uh, suggesting that even though male rats obviously are not uh, giving birth uh, and experiencing the pain associated with that, uh, the POEF, uh, when there is a pain stimulus, uh, uh, benefit from the POEF uh, factor. What time scale is this operating over? Just the, the next few hours after eating it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, actually, for the pain reduction, uh, we're talking about a matter of minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I think is what Crystal found for, for rats and women. Uh, and as some would argue, it's the, and, and in terms of the caretaking behaviors, the first few hours. So um, this is obviously the critical. This is often obviously the critical time of, of care, and so again has been proposed as uh, a real benefit of consuming the design. So one of the other really interesting things uh, about this, I think, is that for human, uh, uh, bovine, mouse, and dolphin placenta. Uh, Placental tissue from all of these species, again, including humans, have been given to rats. And it uh, turns out that these rats uh, uh, have this opioid enhancing effect uh, when they're subjected to painful stimuli. So um, uh, this seems to suggest that POEF is uh, in all mammalian uh, amniotic fluid uh, and uh, placental tissue, or at least a wide swath of uh, these taxa. Uh, and it also suggests that it may be, there may be a, a, a mechanism for responding uh, to POEF uh, that is ubiquitous among mammals as well. I mean, the fact that you can give a rat um, placental tissue from a human being or a dolphin and it has the same opioid enhancing effect is pretty remarkable. And it does suggest that this capacity has been highly conserved uh, um, in our evolutionary history for mammals, not just obviously human beings. So humans make this factor. Uh, this molecule is present in human amniotic fluid and placenta. And no experimental studies for obvious reasons have been done to uh, test uh, its um, opioid enhancing uh, capabilities, but uh, we know that it, it exists in the tissue and in the fluid. Oh, and by the way, uh, I forgot to mention back up here with uh, this uh, preliminary uh, experimental evidence suggesting enhanced caretaking behavior. I'm sure many of you know that there's some interesting recent uh, observations for, free, uh, for wild chimps uh, as well as bonobos and 
these observational studies have shown that, um, or these observations have shown that these, these bonobo and chimp moms are giving uh, birth in more social contexts with other females around, and, and they're sharing the placenta uh, with these other females as well. This has been shown in both uh, chimps and bonobos. Uh, recently, it's been documented recently, the last five years or so. And with bonobos, I think just in the last couple of years. Douglas. So, what about humans? Here we're talking about this, uh, this ubiquitous behavior, uh, this uh, apparently uh, mammalian, uh, universal mammalian uh, molecule or molecules that's in placental tissue and, and uh, fluid. Um, do any of these benefits, enhanced caretaking behavior, bonding, milk production, uh, reduced pain, uh, has this seeped into the behavioral repertoire for humans and uh, uh, conserved this desire to eat the placenta uh, after parturition. This was certainly the first question on my mind when I was exposed to placenta vagina. I didn't know much about it. I, I come from a rural background, so you know I knew that this was something that a lot of mammals did. I didn't know how ubiquitous the behavior was. And when I was learning more about it about 10 years ago, uh, my first question to the person that was giving a, a talk much like this was, well, what kind of research is being done on humans and what human populations engage in this as a traditional uh, uh, cultural practice? I mean, surely, uh, of, the, of the world's thousands of cultures, there's, there's some somewhere, uh, historically in the ethnographic record, where this has been incorporated as a traditional cultural practice, given its, uh, its manifold benefits. And there really wasn't much done, much to my surprise. Uh, um, William Ober had uh, written a book in 1980, published in 1990, I should say, bottoms up, and there's a chapter at the end of the book where he talks about placenta as medicine in uh, several cultures around the world, most of them small-scale cultures around the world, uh, where it was used for ritual purposes or uh, uh, as a medicine, uh, but in rare circumstances. Um, and there were a couple of very small uh, surveys, but uh, nothing that satisfied uh, my graduate student, Sharon Young, and I at the time. So we decided to uh, investigate this uh, with, in the cross-cultural record with the human relation area files, and um, we essentially uh, uh, had a search. We, we, we got information on all the societies in EGRAF that, uh, that brought back results when we put our search terms in, everything that we could think of associated with the placenta. The placenta after birth, amniotic fluid, uh, uh, umbilical cord, etc. Uh, everything that we could think of we used as search terms and um, uh, queried 179, uh, found 179 societies uh, that had said something about the placenta in these human societies after, after birth, what was done with it. And interestingly enough, uh, we didn't find one uh, that practiced maternal placenta phagy as a traditional uh, cultural practice. Which was a bit of a surprise to us because by this time I had been talking to a lot of people and no matter who I talk to about maternal placenta phagy, to a person everybody always says, oh yeah, I know of some, some small scale indigenous population in Indonesia or Melanesia or elsewhere. Uh, I've heard that, and from the group that I work with or whatever, that they do something like this, uh, sort of reminds one of uh, um, uh, people being told of cannibalism by you know, those folks over there, uh, very, very common in, uh, in some reports uh, uh, in the ethnographic record as well. But in terms of direct observational evidence, none. Now, what's interesting about uh, the study, we've had over 100 of these 179 societies that had very specific ideas about what to do with the placenta. Uh, once, uh, um, um, once uh, after, after following birth, but none of them included eating it. So, the, by far the most common uh, use of the placenta or, or how it was treated uh, uh, after birth was burial. Uh, intentional placement was another. This included uh, putting the placenta in a tree or on a scaffold. Uh, some other special place. Uh, incineration was also a relatively uh, common method of disposal as well. And oftentimes there was 
uh, ritual uh, associated, usually simple rituals associated with these practices, but nevertheless, uh, they were, um, they, they certainly were ritualized to, to some extent. So lots of very specific, culturally specific ideas about what should be done with the placenta, but no one is eating it. And as a biological, as a, as a biological anthropologist, a biocultural anthropologist, this was a real red flag to me. Uh, I mean, in, in this context of mammalian ubiquity, this highly conserved behavior, one that apparently does have very, very clear demonstrable uh, benefits, at least in uh, many uh, uh, taxa, why wouldn't humans uh, be consuming the placenta, given that? I mean, even if it was neutral, even if it didn't have some of the beneficial effects that we see in other animals, you would expect somewhere uh, that this practice would be uh, would be maintained through a cultural tradition. And yet we didn't find uh, any of that. Um, again, I, I mentioned the example of, of cannibalism. And I've had people say, well, it's just like cannibalism. Uh, uh, there's a universal taboo against cannibalism. And uh, so um, for whatever reason, symbolic or whatever, um, Placentophagy falls into that same sort of category, and you have this universal symbolic uh, association uh, that leads to a taboo. And that's true, but the problem with that argument is even for cannibalism, probably the best example of this, there's actually lots of societies that engage in cannibalism, oftentimes endocannibalism, it's very small amounts, uh, um, associated with funerary rites, uh, the foray come to mind, the Yanomami come to mind, there's plenty of others. Uh, there's dozens of societies that engage in some sort of cannibalism, again, often uh, relatively symbolic, but uh, still we see ethnographic examples of this, first-hand accounts of this, and we also have historic accounts uh, and ethnographic accounts of cannibalism uh, as well uh, among the Iroquois, Fijians, uh, uh, in Mesoamerica, uh, and elsewhere. So uh, that's more what one would expect. Uh, uh, where there weren't obvious deleterious consequences associated with a behavior like cannibalism, which is a, if, if one needs protein or one needs food, this is uh, one way to get nutrients. Uh, um, you would expect to see then some examples of it in the historic and ethnographic record, not something we see with Pacific Fisher. Okay, so the conspicuous absence of human maternal placentophagy. Uh, what, so this got my students and I to thinking about, well, what could be the reasons that humans don't engage in this practice? And uh, of course, I don't need to tell this group. We thought in terms of purifying selection, since we just don't see any examples of this anywhere. Uh, selective removal, parable traits that are deleterious. Does the complete absence of maternal placentophagy as a traditional practice indicate some sort of species-specific danger? That was the, 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 the question we asked ourselves and set out to uh, answer or speculate about. What unique human or hominin, perhaps, factors uh, would make an otherwise ubiquitous mammalian behavior deleterious for humans? Uh, again, when our closest primate relatives all consume the placenta uh, at pre high percentages. And we came up with two possibilities. One, we actually published uh, this speculative hypothesis. We had a little bit more indirect evidence, and an editor had mercy on us. Um, so the two possibilities associated with the evolution of Homo. One would be the controlled use of fire. This is something, obviously, that no other primates do, no other mammals do. This does make us special. And uh, maybe that has something to do with the fact that we don't consume the placenta. And makes it dangerous. Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's protracted and difficult childbirth. Uh, interestingly enough, both of these are uh, thought to have occurred uh, uh, in that same sort of time range, anywhere from about 2 million years ago to 250,000 years ago, in, in either case. Uh, and let's take these uh, one at a time. So what about placental toxicity uh, with the controlled use of fire? So we know that uh, toxic heavy metals are released in uh, fire, smoke, and ash. In fact, did, did any of you see recently there was a big announcement? It was at a, a, a conference. Uh, they had actually, um, uh, this was a, um, wasn't published, it was a, uh, a conference presentation uh, on environmental toxicology or something, and uh, an international conference. And they had actually found what looked like tiny particles of air pollution 
uh, embedded in placentas uh, in this research. This was just in, in the last uh, uh, few months. Um, uh, we were thinking about this back in 2012, and uh, we thought, well, maybe we wouldn't have tiny particles lodged in the placenta, but we would still potentially have uh, toxicants that get filtered out there. So uh, worldwide, uh, the most commonly used biomass fuel for domestic cooking and heating fires is wood to this day. Um, in a review uh, of hardwood soft, uh, of hard and soft wood smoke emissions, um, uh, Larson and Koenig identified over 70 chemical constituents of wood smoke. And this would include cadmium, magnesium, iron, and 15 other metals. And uh, many of the metals uh, were heavy metals. So, uh, again, cadmium, inorganic uh, mercury, trivalent, chromium. These, the last three that I mentioned, uh, especially mercury and uh, cadmium, uh, differentially accumulate in the placenta. So the placenta is a, is a filter, uh, but it filters out some toxicants uh, and some things better than others. And uh, mercury and cadmium in particular are sort of differentially, uh, differentially filtered. So experimental animal research, in addition to research with human cell cultures and case studies of exposed populations, indicate that cadmium accumulates in the liver and kidneys and the reproductive organs, including ovaries, and cadmium is an endocrine uh, disruptor as well. And since cadmium has a long half-life, about 20 years, uh, multiple births in which the placenta would be eaten, uh, in addition to accumulation of chronic smoke exposure, uh, would uh, cause increasingly higher accumulations of the metal before the mother's body would have, uh, be able to excrete significant amounts of the toxicant. So acute exposure to cadmium or some other uh, heavy metal or toxicant uh, uh, in, in fire smoke uh, uh, and its harmful effects uh, via maternal placentophagy could have fitness reducing effects uh, for mothers and or offspring through at least three distinct pathways, we uh, hypothesized. One, by reducing the mother's health shortly after ingestion uh, of the placenta, impairing her survival or ability to care for her infant. There are uh, acute uh, effects associated, uh, there are effects associated with, with acute doses of uh, 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 cadmium that are pretty disabling. Secondly, by reducing the mother's long-term reproductive uh, health, uh, again, these cadmium accumulates, this heavy metal accumulates in the ovaries and is an endocrine disruptor. And three, by negatively impacting the health and reproductive success, or both, uh, of her and her offspring uh, through exposures to dangerous levels of environmental metals in breast milk. And we know, for example, that in smokers, uh, anybody that smokes, uh, uh, cadmium is one of the things that you get in cigarette smoke as well. Uh, and we know in studies done with smokers, uh, that's where we actually get most of our data in terms of how much cadmium accumulates in the placenta. Uh, we know that um, about 10% of the cadmium, cadmium that's in circulation in mother's blood is in her breast milk. So significant amounts of this heavy metal uh, could be passed on to the neonate. So this is our fire hypothesis. We published it uh, in uh, Ecology of Food and Nutrition and just suggested that this is one potential explanation for uh, why we don't see uh, uh, human uh, maternal placenta phage, that it would have been selected out as a, uh, uh, from the human behavioral repertoire as a result uh, through some sort of proximate mechanism, a disgust mechanism or something um, uh, that maybe today is short-circuited uh, through uh, modern uh, methods of consuming placenta. Okay, the other idea that we had, the other speculation that we had, uh, had to do with uh, placental uh, infection. And um, uh, of course, many of you have seen this figure before uh, from the obstetric dilemma. Uh, I know the obstetric dilemma is sort of under, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is having kind of a rough time right now, um, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Whether it's due to a, a metabolic constraint or whether it's due to um, uh, issues having to do with uh, fit of our bony archi uh, uh, architecture, it doesn't really matter. We know that uh, by 200,000 years ago, even uh, uh, Holly Dunsworth uh, is saying that by 200,000 years ago, humans are experiencing uh, protracted, uh, long and difficult birth. So what does this mean uh, potentially for, for placentophagy? Well, we know that uh, a neonatal infection risk increases with uh, protracted uh, labor and obstructive labor. Um, and that there's plenty of 
infectious agents uh, that could be responsible for this. And uh, I'll, I'll mention too that the, the longer the period between amniotic membrane rupture when the, the water breaks uh, and birth, the higher the risk of placental uh, infection. Uh, so uh, chorioamnionitis. And that infection takes place due to colonies of bacteria that are in the vaginal and anal area uh, of women who are giving birth. And again, so the longer uh, the, the labor process, the more likely that placenta is going to get infected with E. coli or group B strep. Mom then consumes the placenta after she's labored long and hard and consumes the placenta uh, she ends up uh, having an acute infection, uh, and the, this infection then, uh, we know, can be uh, passed to her neonate uh, via uh, breast milk. And we know that groupy strep is serious stuff, and uh, it lands kids in intensive care units um, uh, regularly. So this obviously could have severe fitness, uh, deleterious fitness effects uh, for mom and baby as well. Okay, so shifting gears here a little bit out of the evolutionary mode and these, this speculation about why we don't see uh, placentophagy as a traditional cultural practice, uh, we'll come back to the potential health consequences of consuming the placenta in a contemporary context because as far as we know, it's only been in the last few decades that we see the first evidence uh, uh, of uh, human placentophagy, uh, but it's in a very new context. The first written reports we have of human maternal placentophagy, again, since it isn't a historic cultural uh, or cross-cultural practice, uh, is in the early 1980s. And it's all done in the context of the home birth and the natural uh, birth community. Um, these midwives typically and their clients are taking the placenta. Here's a a good example of a human placenta here, that discoid placenta. And at that time, at this time when these first reports uh, were being written up in, in places like uh, midwifery today, um, the midwives and the moms were uh, cutting up the placentas and walking them or frying them uh, with onions or whatever, baking them into lasagnas and then consuming them as a, in a meal, uh, oftentimes with other family members or friends and so forth. And people talked about uh, just how incredible the feeling was eating this placenta, uh, not only for their connection with nature, but uh, uh, the, the rush that they were getting from consuming this organ. Subsequently, so, so placenta phage then languishes for, as far as we can tell, 20 years. Uh, this, is, this is an incredibly rare practice. Uh, still, again, uh, associated, we have a, a occasional reports from the from the home birth, um, uh, natural birth uh, context, but it's very, very rare. Uh, then something happens uh, around the year 2000, and that is uh, people start to encapsulate the placenta. And these are people traditionally coming from, uh, that are influenced by traditional Chinese medicine, we'll get to that connection in a moment, uh, and uh, they're providing these capsules uh, to women, oftentimes these are midwives that are, do, that are learning to do this, and they're providing these capsules to midwives. Some women are learning to do it themselves. And they're uh, able then to take the placenta over an extended period of time, usually several weeks, uh, rather than all at once, uh, and uh, enjoy some of the benefits that are being claimed already by women who are consuming uh, the placenta, uh, either cooked into a meal, raw, uh, or uh, put into capsules. Undoubtedly, it, it seems like the uh, encapsulation, which is by far the most common method of consumption today, uh, has to do with some sort of sh sor short circuiting uh, of uh, some kind of disgust response associated either visually or olfactory with the placenta. We've done some pilot experimental research with this, and there seems to be something there. Uh, sort of, uh, uh, lots of anecdotal evidence as well. People can't take the idea of eating a placenta, raw or otherwise, but you know, just taking a, a capsule, like a supplement, so, yeah, sure, no problem. I can do that for, for, uh, for three weeks, especially with all the benefits that supposedly come along with it. And uh, certainly this is an incredibly, as I can attest, <laughs> one of the few uh, scientists in, in the world doing placentophagy research. Uh, this is a super media-friendly topic. Uh, um, everybody wants a piece of this story, uh, usually, oftentimes, with tongue-in-cheek. 
uh, sometimes by uh, serious uh, science uh, journalists. Uh, but everybody wants to cover placentophagy, and you guys have, uh, of course, the, the, T, the, the TZM or TMZ, whatever it is, uh, effect is important here too, the celebrities that are doing it. Some of you might remember when Tom Cruise claimed that he did it, and there's so much backlash from it that he eventually said, oh, I was just kidding, I didn't really, but he, he was pretty adamant initially that he and his wife at the time uh, did so. And then January Jones and uh, uh, one of the Kardashians, uh, many of these celebrities have eaten their placentas and they, they, they placenta, and they get lots of media coverage as a result. That's undoubtedly helped the movement, if you want to call it that, uh, of placenta encapsulation for maternal benefit, for maternal health benefits. We'll get into that here in a moment. So, um, who are these advocates and proponents? They're midwives, they're doulas, encapsulation specialists, people that are doing this for a fee, which is around 200 $250 uh, dollars, uh, to take the placenta uh, and um, process it and encapsulate it. Um, and they're the ones usually that are spreading the word about the benefits uh, of placentophagy as well, and with a complete lack of any sort of scientific uh, evidence. So advocates, though, are, well, they're adamant. They're adamant that they, these effects are real, that they worked for them. They've had, they've had children and when they didn't take their placenta and had children when they did. The difference is amazing. Uh, it, is a, it is a strong campaign on the part of placenta phagy believers. And they claim a whole host of postpartum maternal health benefits, improved mood and energy, improved lactation, uh, mother-infant attachment. All of these things uh, are supposed to come directly from uh, the practice. They promote the practice by emphasizing, and this is important, you see this everywhere, it's ubiquity in nature. It's natural benefits. Again, comes from the natural health movement, the home health movement. And these folks are people who one might, as one might expect, they tend to be anti-vaxxers. They tend to be people who say, this isn't the way we are meant to be in nature. And uh, if I'm going to take any sort of remedy, it's going to be a natural one. Um, so they emphasize the, that, uh, uh, that connection. And they also highlight the importance and the sacredness of placenta and our, our paper is often cited here, uh, talking about rituals associated with placental disposal and so forth, highlight the importance and sacredness of placenta in ancient and small-scale societies. So I view placentophagy in non-Western societies, um, and especially uh, traditional Chinese medicine, as confirmation of placenta's efficacy and ancient roots as a human um, practice. And uh, I, as I have one uh, placenta encapsulation uh, uh, specialists tell me once when smelling uh, the freshly processed placenta, mm, it smells like ancient wisdom. So the ingestion of dried human placenta uh, was first recorded as a medical remedy in the 16th century uh, in the TMC compendium, Benka uh, Gangmu, uh, forgive me uh, for those of you Mandarin speakers. Uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, Zi Hecheng, which is dried human placenta is believed to primarily affect the lungs, the liver, kidneys, and is used to treat a whole host of ailments. Female infertility, of course, male impotence, back pain, lightheadedness, low milk supply, interestingly, uh, in lactating women, seizures, hot flashes, emaciation, chronic cough, uh, a whole host of other ailments depending on, uh, on your diagnosis. So. Uh, the use of um, placenta veggie as a medicine, or placenta as a medicine, has been around for some time, but I'll, I'll stress here, this is not maternal placenta veggie. This isn't what we see in nature. This is people taking, as a, as a medical remedy, other women's placentas, uh, and for specific uh, ailments, uh, not in an immediate postpartum period. So who are these moms, trying to finish up here in the next few minutes, who are these moms, why are they doing this, and how are they processing uh, consuming their placentas, and is it safe for mom uh, and baby to do so? And that's especially important. Some of you may have heard uh, there was lots of media coverage about this CDC case report, a single case report from 2017, about a uh, organ mom who uh, encapsulated, had her placenta encapsulated. Turns out her baby was uh, admitted to the hospital a few days after birth with a group B strep uh, infection, a very, very serious infection, potentially life-threatening. Uh, and uh, they couldn't figure out why it, uh, why it was infected. They, they had done a, uh, a check of the mother at uh, uh, 36 weeks, and uh, they ended up finding out that she had 
encapsulated your placenta, they, they checked the placenta, the placenta capsules were contaminated with uh, group B strep. They concluded that it was the placenta capsules that led to the neonates infection. That's debatable. Perhaps it was, but when these there's a lot of group B strep infections that take place after the baby's taken home from the hospital, and usually uh, the parents are colonized with the bacteria, uh, other family members, and so forth, and fomites, and uh, and the baby ends up getting infected that way. But who knows? In this case, it might have been the placenta capsules. It certainly caused quite a, a, an uproar in the media uh, at the time, and there was all sorts of. Uh, headlines saying, don't eat your placenta capsules, your baby can get uh, sepsis as a result. Well, uh, I worked with a couple of um, colleagues from Oregon State University, and we worked with the uh, Midwives Alliance of North America, and we basically did a, me uh, a medical records-based study, uh, and we looked at uh, over uh, 17,000 births over the course of one year through this medical records registry. Uh, th these, and these medical records were created by uh, certified midwives. And we had some pretty big numbers. Uh, uh, 7,000 women uh, had consumed their placentas. These were clients of these midwives. 7,000 over that one year period. 10,000 women uh, in this registry uh, did not consume their placenta over the same time period. So we had a nice control group. Uh, and uh, 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 nice large numbers that I'm not used to working with as an anthropologist, so it was really nice to, to work with these kinds of numbers. So the women who ate the placenta, consumers, who were they uh, demographically? Well, you guys can't apologize, you can't see this very well. Um, uh, they fit a pretty standard profile, something that we had seen in previous uh, pilot research. Uh, they were uh, a little bit older, uh, averaged uh, about 31 years of age. They were predominantly white, college educated uh, primarily, tended to be married, and middle income. And this is, this is the demographic profile you typically get of placentophagic women. Uh, so our, uh, our findings were pretty much confirmatory in that uh, regard. How, do they, how are they consuming the placenta? Well, you'll see here, uh, uh, there's a couple of ways uh, that they were consuming it, primarily dehydrated uh, from uncooked. We've got raw here, so uh, the placenta is not steamed or cooked or baked beforehand. It's simply dehydrated uh, at about 130 degrees for eight hours and then encapsulated, um, pulverized and encapsulated. About half the women who consume their placenta chose this method. And we were surprised by that because previous studies had suggested that cooking the placenta first, this is the traditional Chinese medicine approach. You cook it first, you steam it, then you dehydrate it, then you pulverize it. And our pilot study of around 200 women several years earlier had shown that uh, that was the most, by far, the most common method. Things have shifted and now uh, a, a larger percentage of women, at least based on our uh, national study here, uh, are, are consuming it uh, uncooked, but uh, processed and encapsulated. Some women were still eating it raw. We had 600 women, around 9%, that were eating it uh, either alone, usually it's frozen, cut little pieces off and just put it in your mouth and, and swallow it uh, uh, like a pill, uh, or, um, um, or blend it into a smoothie or the like. There's a, all kinds of different ways to consume it. So they're eating it primarily uncooked and encapsulated. Remember the CDC report uh, that said it was uncooked and encapsulated placenta capsules that caused this baby's uh, uh, group B strep infection. So what were the reasons for these women consuming uh, the placenta? Well, why were they doing it? Um, because the midwives asked uh, this, this question of them too. And 73% of them said the primary reason that they were engaging in placenta phagy was to improve postpartum mood, either prevent the baby blues uh, or the more serious postpartum depression. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not surprising that um, uh, so many women are concerned uh, about postpartum depression. The World Health Organization says that somewhere between 10 and 20% of all uh, women who give birth suffer from postpartum depression, and maybe as many as 75 or 80% experience the baby blues, which is uh, uh, less serious affective disorder, usually taking place in the first 10 days or so postpartum, uh, but that usually resolves after that. Um, uh, postpartum depression is a serious problem, and uh, many of the women that I've talked to in the course of my research say 
it, they've either experienced it before or they're very afraid of it, and this is their motivation for engaging in the practice. And there were some other reasons too, as you can see, but um, um, uh, postpartum effect was the big one. Was it safe? Well, we were able to look at neonatal outcomes. So uh, you can see here, this is for placenta consumption, yes and no. Uh, we looked at three outcome measures. We looked at neonatal intensive care unit admissions over the first six weeks. We looked at neonatal hospitalization over the first six weeks. So um, neonatal in intensive care unit is here. And you can see that the percentages, uh, actually the women that consume the placentas, a smaller percentage of their infants ended up in the NICU. 2.2% uh, versus 2.8% for the women who did not consume this placenta. We also looked at neonatal hospitalization, not in the intensive care unit. 3.4% of the cons placenta consumers, uh, kids ended up in the hospital, and 3.6% uh, of the non-consumers. And then there was neonatal death too, but there were so few of those. Uh, a statistical comparison wasn't possible. 16 for the non-placental consumers and only one uh, for placenta consumers. So the upshot of this, uh, we were a, little, a bit surprised about this, is it seems to be a relatively safe practice, uh, even given the fact that uh, half the women in our sample, uh, over 3,000 of these women, uh, were consuming it uncooked and not taking it to a temperature that is typically considered <coughs> safe in terms of food safety, which is 160, 165 degrees. Uh, so we were somewhat surprised by that, but there's some other data uh, that sheds light on that. So summary of current known health risks and benefits associated with placenta consumption. There's been some work done uh, by a lab in Germany, uh, as well as our lab. Uh, and uh, what we found, back to the issue of uh, heavy metal toxicants, we've tested placentas to see if there's lots of heavy metals in placentas of American and German women. And it turns out, no, there's not. It's not all that surprising. We're not around uh, open fire smoke, typically, uh, in the US and in Germany. Uh, we, we expected uh, these levels to be low. It'd be very interesting to see uh, what these levels are in the placentas of uh, women in, um, in societies, uh, else, small scale societies, elsewhere in the world, developing countries where there's a lot of biomass fi uh, um, fire smoke being inhaled. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm guessing you'd see very, very different numbers indeed. But for women in the developed uh, West, uh, these aren't an issue. And you can see some of the other uh, heavy metals like lead um, here uh, and uranium. These are also very, very low in terms of parts per million. Pathogenic organisms. My colleagues in Germany at uh, uh, Yen University, uh, the university hospital there, uh, the placenta lab, they looked at, at a relatively small sample, eight placentas, but they looked at pathogenic organisms. They didn't find any group B strep, but they looked at E. coli uh, and some other uh, pathogenic bugs. Uh, and they found that steaming and dehydrating, uh, especially, but also just dehydrating, uh, uh, significantly reduced uh, the bacterial loads, the pathogenic bacterial loads uh, from raw down to um, steamed and dehydrated or uh, just dehydrated. Um, and these gray bars actually show um, the bacterial load, uh, the pathogenic bacterial load, uh, um, up to four weeks uh, being stored just at room temperature, which was kind of surprising. Uh, some of these samples were stored refrigerated, some room temperature. Uh, didn't seem to matter. Uh, they, they didn't have a high pathogenic load. You can see their room temperature on the right uh, uh, and uh, uh, four degrees. Uh, refrigerated on the left, it's actually more bugs in the one that ref it was refrigerated. We actually did a, a phase one randomized clinical trial. Um, now, phase one trials, as most of you know, is primarily to establish safety uh, for uh, medical practices, devices, and uh, medicines, uh, and also as feasibility studies, so we have a very, very small end, but we also looked at some health outcomes, and what did we find? Basically, uh, that this was a double-blind study. Women didn't know if they were getting a placenta, if they were getting a placebo. Um, we didn't know either, so double-blind um, was a, a, over a three-week period postpartum. Uh, we did find that it affected women's hormone levels. Uh, we checked them uh, three times over the course of the study. Um, but it didn't look like those hormone changes made a significant improvement in either iron status, which a lot of people claim is the reason placentophagy leads to improved energy levels. A lot of 
pregnant uh, uh, women and women who have just uh, delivered or anemic. Uh, but we didn't see any change in iron status of placentophages versus those who took the placebo. And we didn't see any effects in the things that women take these uh, capsules for, mood, uh, bonding, fatigue, placebo controls. On the other hand, um, we used, in our, uh, for safety reasons, in our phase one trial, we used the steamed uh, and um, uh, dehydrated method rather than just the dehydrated method. And as you'll see, uh, that greatly reduces the hormone content. Uh, so while these capsules that were steamed and dehydrated did have detectable levels of things like uh, prolactin and uh, estrone and progesterone, uh, they were reduced by typically anywhere between 98 and 99 percent. So these were very, very small amounts, enough to affect systemic circulation, but still that's uh, not maybe so surprising we didn't see any uh, effects in terms of things like fatigue or mood or the like. So uh, to, <laughs> to, to finish up here, uh, future uh, research comparisons uh, of heavy metal concentration varying by hab habitual fire, uh, smoke exposure, I mentioned that earlier in the developing world and perhaps in small scale societies. Um, comparative placenta preparation methods, looking at hormone degradation, as I mentioned, uh, Johnson et al, uh, the, the, the German team showed anywhere between three and 48 fold uh, uh, increase in hormone concentration in dehydrated only uh, versus steamed dehydrated placental tissue. You still lose a lot, 85, 90%, uh, from raw, but it's uh, three, four, five, and more times uh, the uh, hormone concentration. So uh, that could be interesting. Pathogenic microbial infection, certainly with the group B strep issue, this needs to be uh, investigated further. Appeal to discuss studies uh, of um, perhaps if there is some sort of uh, human aversion to placenta, this would be important to know. A phase two uh, uh, randomized uh, clinical trial. Um, and this would likely include alternative processing uh, preparations. And I'll note that uh, there's a recent uh, phase three trial, randomized clinical trial, um, by Metzer and Brody, where they looked at allopregnolone. This was one of the steroid hormones we looked at in our phase one trial. And they found that in an injectable form, it performed brilliantly from phase one through phase three trials. So this is injecting, essentially, a proprietary uh, um, formulation of this hormone, allopregnolone, which is in placenta, and uh, they found that it's very, very effective in treating postpartum depression. So stay tuned, there may be something uh, there. And of course, that would be something we'd be very interested in in a phase two trial. And then finally, ethnographic uh, analysis. We really know nothing about these women who are choosing to engage in placenta. <laughs> we don't really know anything about uh, the advocates, the midwives, the doulas, the encapsulation specialists uh, that are promoting this practice. Uh, how are decisions being made? How are these women assessing risk? Uh, we really just don't know, and it would be nice to have some, um, uh, some good ethnographic work done in this area as well. Okay, I've gone well over my time. Thank you all for your patience. A couple of acknowledgments. Again, thanks to Brooke. Thanks uh, for the BEC uh, speaker series uh, of uh, research participants, students, collaborators, funding sources. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Be glad to answer any questions. Thinking back to the, the chart that was showing the different rates of consumers and non-consumers across different, um, you don't have to pull back up so okay. if you want to. Um, I was just wondering whether, so I was interested in the differences in kind of uptake um, from home births, birthing centers, hospitals, in terms of um, women who choose to consume and not consume. I was wondering whether the rates of um, availability and access are similar. Um, you know, if you give birth in a hospital, is it um, mm -hmm. is the hospital open to and required to give you the placenta if you request okay. it? Great question. So this is a this is an area of evolving law, and there are several states that require the release of the placenta if the mother asks for it. Mm -hmm. I think they're Hawaii, Texas, Washington, Oregon, and there's one more I can't recall. Uh, but five states require that, so all you have to do as a mom is request the, the release of the placenta, and it, and, it, and it must be a release to you. Otherwise, it's pretty much based on the uh, administration in that particular hospital or sometimes state and county laws. So um, there is issues with getting the placenta from hospitals in some cases, particularly in those states that don't have laws mandating it. 
And this is a problem for people who want to engage in placenta phagy because you want to get the placenta as quickly as you can after birth to have a process that takes almost 48 hours to process it. So uh, a lot of women start having their worst symptoms in terms of, of uh, baby blues peaking around two, uh, day three, day four. So the, the more quickly you can get the placenta and encapsulate it, so the proponents claim, uh, the, the sooner you're going to be able to have the capsules to, to do their magic uh, and help you uh, in the postpartum period. So um, in terms of, in terms of uh, access, in a previous survey that we did, uh, we, we surveyed about 200 women, just under 200 women that had consumed their placentas previously. And much to our surprise, over half of them had given birth in the hospital. We, we thought that it was, at this time, this is in 2013, we thought that almost all these women were going to be in home birth and birthing center uh, context. And uh, now, granted, it wasn't sampled uh, in a scientific way. Uh, but um, based on our convenience sample, we, we were surprised, nevertheless, by the number of women uh, who, um, almost half, uh, uh, who had, had given birth in the hospital, who'd gotten the placenta from, from the hospital and then had it encapsulated. So uh, those, are, those are issues. And I think that is why you do uh, see uh, a higher percentage of, we don't know what the percentages are of women who give birth in hospitals that encapsulate their placentas. I'm sure it's very, very small, uh, one or two percent perhaps. It's maybe 20 or 30 percent uh, of women who are giving birth in home birth and midwife uh, and uh, birth center context. So there is a there is a context difference there. Yeah, Sean. Do you know if it's common for people in small sale societies to eat animal placentas? Yeah, great question. Um, I have never seen an, uh, I, I've never seen a report of that. Um, it, it very well could be that um, people do um, collect placentas and, and cook them, but I have I have never heard of that. Yeah. Um, is there any data on you know if there's greater variability in domesticate placenta consumption as opposed to sort of their wild ancestors because that seems like it would be a oh, way domesticated animals yeah so I, I'm just like sort of reflecting on you know my field site and you know there are dogs that spend a lot of time near the fire in the house and I was just wondering if you had any data on yeah of oh, uh, another good question I my, my sense is is that particularly for um, we, I mean, we have a lot of data. On, we have a lot of data on non-human primates, and the 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 percentages of um, of mothers, particularly uh, ape species, that consume the placenta is high. Um, how that would compare uh, in other species where you have uh, you know, wild and, and domesticated uh, wild species and domesticated varieties, you know, I just don't know. But that's an that's an interesting. A question: Thinking whether or not the incidence has decreased, or one would imagine perhaps it would decrease with domesticates because there isn't the predation pressure. Yeah, perhaps. And also, just you know, being around controlled fire regularly as a. You know, oh, I see. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Huh? That, that's. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, bro. Um. So I'm just wondering about. Um. There. There was almost no mention of the woman of the women in your study about the um, analgesic effects. So yeah. has people talk about taking these pills and help, helping with postpartum healing? Like yeah. Healing <clears throat> you're, you're absolutely right. This isn't something that women talk about. Um, and it's you know affect is the, the number one thing. Energy levels, um, fatigue, sleep quality, uh, bonding, all those things are talked about. But, I don't recall ever seeing anyone say pain reduction, uh, at least nobody that I've talked with in person, I don't recall those data. So that's interesting because of course a lot of women can experience significant postpartum pain and you, you imagine if you'd be consuming these uh, shortly after giving birth. It could be a matter of the amounts taken, but based on Crystal's work, um, ideally the amounts are relatively small. So I would think that encapsulated sort of concentrated placenta would, would lead to that, but yeah, we don't, we don't see that. Yeah. You're gonna have like a million questions. Oh, sure. so Please. <laughs> All right. Um, so, have you done interviews, um, or are you aware of of people's responses when non-maternal um, humans are consuming placenta 
afterwards, like when people have placenta parties. I'm just wondering in terms of the like, you know, why are you, at, you know, you're presumably not, not you, sorry, one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Why is one who is not at risk of, say, postpartum depression choosing to consume placenta? Is it like to bond with the mom? Is it because when else do you get to eat human flesh? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just really interested. <laughs> Again, this is where this is where there's a real need for some good ethnographic work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know I don't know what the there's, there's a lot of different angles on this. One certainly for me as a medical anthropologist, one certainly is the public health angle. I, I think you know based on the numbers that I've crunched, uh, I don't see how there's any way there could be fewer than 40,000 women a year in the U.S. consuming their placenta. Maybe. 200,000, 300,000, just depending on how many women in hospital settings are consuming them. We just don't have a good way to estimate that right now. It, by the way, it varies very much by part of the country. So the Northwest, by far the most. Uh, um, also pretty high levels, maybe surprisingly in the Midwest, but in the Southeast, uh, Northeast, the lowest levels, sort of intermediate in the intermontane West and Southwest. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we just don't know the answers to these questions. And there's obviously a lot of moms out there, and maybe even with their partners and other family members. I've even heard of people sharing it with their kids um, when it's baked into a meal. Like, you guys, yes, a, a placenta, uh, a lasagna is something that you, you can look up this stuff on the internet. There are recipes for placenta, for preparing your placenta on the internet, and it's, and it's one of them. Again, pretty rare, uh, comparatively, Most all women take the capsules, but... Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know these, the answers to these questions. Good ethnographic work. Quick question to discuss. Yeah. Um, uh, I was, when you were talking about it, and I was thinking of other kind of unique uh, human disgust mechanisms that mm -hmm. are interesting, because it's not just that we don't do it, it's that we do have that aversion. It's my first right. time really going into detail, and even now during the talk, it's like, ooh. <laughs> Lasagna. Um, yeah. You're not alone, <laughs> right? And I You're shouldn't, right? But I'm thinking about yeah. where else do we share these these disgust mechanisms? And it also is a little comedic, but I couldn't get in my head. But it was just like, are we also the only species that have like a, a booger eating disgust mechanism? Yeah. That it has to do something with aspects of the body that are coming out that might be more social, but it's related to a biological aspect of the body. Like, I don't know any other mammals that have a booger eating avoidance, yeah. Yeah. or if it's a taboo for us, or it's actually a disgust. Um. Yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, the, I, the, the question really is, you know, what would be, what would be driving that disgust response? Um, given its ubiquity, you know, across the class yeah. uh, of, of mammals, it, it, it's hard to imagine that, that, that this disgust response would just sort of pop up de novo just because, well, it is in, you know, actuality disgusting. Uh, something has to be driving that, dis that disgust response. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I usually, like, when you go to the zoo and you make fun of kind of the other, even like the great apes, they're close yeah. to, they still pick their nose all the time. Yeah. You have that diver aversion from the young kids, yeah. going, ew, the chimps. So I'm saying, even in something like that, this doesn't have a, a big biological, they don't have the yeah. effects you see in the placenta. We still have that weird aversion we don't see in any other. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, this is where I really think the first, the first step in, in, in this process has to be doing some well-designed uh, aversion studies, um, aversion appeals studies. And as, as I said, I had some graduate students, undergrads and graduate students do a pilot study. A couple of years ago, we presented the findings at an, an, AAP, uh, an AAPA meeting. And uh, some interesting results. I mean, it suggests there's something there. The problem with our study is our placentas were old. <laughs> And so what you really need is a, you need a fresh placenta. You, you need one that isn't, hasn't been in a 80 below freezer for, uh, uh, for six months. Uh, that really affected, I think, our results. Um, and for whatever it's worth, my, I've been around a lot of placentas over the last 10 years, and, um, including my daughters. And uh, um, I, I think it's a visual. I, I think if there is a visual aversion, a disgust response, it's visual rather than olfactory. The, the smell is unusual, particularly processed placenta, but I, uh, most people that I've talked to, placenta encapsulators, other people that have <coughs> processed their own placentas, um, and people have been around the smell, they're not really disgusted by the smell. The sight uh, really bothers people. Uh, in fact, I've had to change some of, the, some of the images that I've had in my slideshows because people have complained. So. 
So I'm thinking about the fire angle slightly differently, right? But like mm. if if because um, we have some aversion to just raw meat too, right? Right, and spoiled so, meat in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm just wondering if the aversion to placenta could just be sort of a side effect of a general aversion toward raw meat, especially eating raw meat, right? That mm -hmm. we developed at when cooking alone. Again, here I think uh, I, need, I need students to come uh, do this work with me. Th this is where it'd be really interesting to look at uh, again in these controlled experimental uh, designs. Look at in blinded situations people's responses to other organ meats. So, uh, brain, for example, uh, cow brain, uh, liver meats, um, uh, other sorts of. Uh, unprocessed, uncooked meats, and see if there is a, uh, a general uh, um, aversion uh, to those sorts of organ meats compared to, uh, let's say, uh, steak or other sorts of uh, uh, muscle based, uh, and then see if that's, if that's uh, especially the case with placenta. But yeah, I mean, but I think that that I, I think that that question can largely be answered with some well-designed experimental studies. Yes. Uh, this is a very interesting talk. Oh, thank uh, you. A couple of things, you probably know that uh, there have been studies of uh, children who are exposed to habitual fires in their house, yeah. inside cooking, oh, yeah. over many years, yeah. and cognitive assessments and other assessments mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. compared to people in the same communities who, for one reason or another, have um, kerosene or other, other uh, don't do it, right. and there is an effect. Oh, absolutely. However, this is years of exposure to the food and the air and everything else. I, so I, I wonder whether this amount of exposure compared to the what's, what's needed to produce that effect in the natural world could be yeah. an it's, it's an absolute It's an absolute fair question. I think based on the, the, the studies that have been done with smokers where they've looked at placental accumulations, it's pretty significant. The, the big thing about, and, and I, I completely understand what you're talking about with sort of chronic habitual exposure uh, to these to this smoke, oftentimes in houses that are yeah. not ventilated. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, smoke. The, yeah the effects are just, uh, yeah, and, and the smoke is everywhere. Yeah. But the thing about the, the in, in this case, is you have, it's, it's the acute dose. And one of the things we've looked at is what happens with cadmium, for example, when it's not a small dose, over, you know, chronic, where there can be excretion of, of the toxic if it's if it's a relatively if it's a if it's a chronic exposure but it's relatively low exposure what what's the difference where you have this acute dose where this stuff is accumulating over a nine month period and then mom eats well in cases as in nature all of it uh, at once um, there you could have some really serious deleterious consequences and again could get in the breast milk uh, that could also cause these problems. But it's a fair, it's a fair question. Again, we need, we need more research. My other question is this whole idea of uh, pro-naturalism, mm. uh, natural health and so on, and, and what, which uh, I think is probably used as a justification for trying it and so on. Absolutely. So pro-naturalism ha has been studied in, in child development for a long time in the U.S. and elsewhere. So there's a lot of things that we believe are natural. Uh, nudity, holding your baby. There's long lists of them, of food uh, preferences. And uh, so there is a literature on this. What One of the findings often is that pro-natural practices that fit into the daily routine of a, of a urbanite tend to fade away. <laughs> <laughs> and things that don't and are otherwise um, uh, socially promoted or uh, make you feel that your identity is confirmed mm -hmm. are, are persistent. So it might be the same effect here, that is, in communities that it, there's nothing deleterious about it and it promotes your social identity, it'll exist. Otherwise, yeah. it'll fade away. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no question about it. And I, and I uh, again, the, the, um, the context in which this is typically taking place, um, which is in that home birth and natural birth community, there tend to be, again, a, a general profile uh, the naturalism, uh, natural health remedies, um, um, and the like that, that suggests that, that this definitely plays in the decision making uh, for these women. Well, one of the things that I find so interesting is that we know, uh, in terms of precautionary behavior, uh, that these, that we're, we're wired 
as human beings to be uh, to engage in more pr precautions during pregnancy and uh, in the neonatal period. Um, women just are, especially new moms and pregnant moms, are likely to be uh, much more cautious in uh, their, de their decision making uh, during this period. And yet, uh, this is one of the puzzles for me with placentophagy, you have these moms who you would think would be extra careful and vigilant and not sure about whether they should do something that could affect their health and the health of their baby, engaging in this practice without any scientific evidence, almost none. I mean, basically, the work that my lab has done and a, and a couple of other labs, uh, one on the East Coast and one in Germany, uh, but otherwise, we really have no idea about the safety, the efficacy, anything about it, and yet these moms are choosing to do it. Of course, the rationalization is usually, well, all, all mammal mothers do it. So if all ma mammal mothers do it, it must be safe for humans to do it, and this is usually the justification, but still. Uh, it, it, it is a bit surprising to me that um, in many other contexts these, these moms wouldn't make decisions in that way, and yet in this particular case they do. Social identity valorization mm. is a powerful. Mm. A powerful thing, yeah. Powerful. Okay, I think we're out of time. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Brian. Sorry, we are yep. really yep. fascinating talk, really interesting oh, well, thank you. material. Um, I, I was wondering if you could give some more details about the observations of chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, I wasn't aware of those studies. Uh, are, are these, uh, for example, in the wild or in the... In the yeah. Uh, Douglas, I believe, I can give you the citation if okay. you'd like. The most recent one is Douglas. I think it was in, uh, in the last couple of years. Okay. And uh, uh, wild population. And, um, um, it, and in fact, it, it even generated some subsequent uh, papers of people talking about obligatory uh, you know, midwifery. And gee, this being such a social event in this uh, in this one particular case with a bonobo female, a bonobo female birth, being so social, the fact that she shared the placenta with uh, the attendants uh, uh, has really led to some sort of interesting uh, um, debate about this and, and, and assertions. Uh, but yeah, there there's. Um, in both of the cases that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, one for uh, common chimps and uh, the other bonobo example, the thing that was emphasized in these observational studies were the sharing of the placenta with other females. So, um, Is there any studies in um, chimpanzees or bonobos in captivity? Yeah, there are. Okay. And do yeah. they, and, and do they here, consume the placenta? Or? Yeah, they do. Okay. But, Oftentimes they're they're kept from they're uh, they're isolated uh, during birth. So the argument has been with these most recent observations. Oh, gee, maybe this is much more common than we had thought. We don't see it in captivity because they're usually isolated. Maybe in the wild, this is a very social event. Uh, not only the the sharing the placenta part, but uh, the actual the actual birthing event. So I'd be happy to send send those along to you. Okay, thank you. Okay.